Hello and welcome to Oxford at Home. For those of you watching live, I'm sorry we've had a little bit of a technical delay at the beginning. That is only natural, I'm sure you'll understand, because we're still all operating from our homes. We're operating on home Wi-Fi. And sometimes just to show you how authentic it is, there's a little bit of a glitch. But nonetheless, it's great to have so many of you here joining us as ever from around the world for this week's Oxford at Home. My name's Rana Mitta. I teach modern Chinese politics and history at Oxford. But today I'm here to introduce today's speaker and today's topic. And to give you a, a little head start on that, let me just give you a quick thought experiment. Not Boris Johnson, but Beatrice Johnson. Not Donald Trump, but Deirdre Trump. If it were the case that either the British Prime Minister or the American President had been women, is it possible that the really relatively pretty high death rates from COVID-19 in both of those countries might have been lower? In other words, is it possible that in the words of Anne W. Ramoyne, an epidemiologist at UCLA, if you're looking for examples of true leadership in a crisis from Iceland to Taiwan and from Germany to New Zealand, countries led by women seem to be particularly successful in fighting the coronavirus? Well, we're going to find out from our speaker today, and I'm going to introduce to you, if I may, Dr. Jennifer Cassidy. Uh, Jennifer is Departmental Lecturer in Global Governance and Diplomacy at Oxford. She got her PhD, or DPhil, as we say, here on the topic of digital diplomacy, and she now lectures on diplomacy, international law, and women in leadership. Uh, a few years ago, 2017, she produced the first edited volume on gender and diplomacy in theory and practice, which provides a detailed discussion of the role of women in diplomacy and crafts a global narrative of understanding related to the current and historical role uh, within it. She's also had a stellar career outside academia. She's been a diplomatic, diplomatic attaché to Ireland's permanent mission to the UN. She served uh, the European Diplomatic Service in Cambodia and has also worked with Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She is, in other words, an eminently expert person to give us what I think is a fascinating and intriguing talk today on the subject of women leadership gender and COVID-19. She's going to speak for about 15 minutes. We'll then, as ever, have about 15 minutes for questions. Remember, you can send them in through the chat window if you're on YouTube or in the comment section of Twitter or Facebook. And do remember, there may be the odd glitch now and then because we are working off home Wi-Fi, but I'm glad to say after a short delay, it's a great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Jennifer Cassidy. Jennifer. Well, thank you so much for that for that lovely introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to to speak today at the Oxford at Home series. So, with that, I think I'll just jump straight in to the topic um, itself. And I thought I'd begin, like uh, we began the introduction, with posing a number of questions for reflection, and that is. It is perhaps no surprise that the pandemic has unleashed a vicious strain of international competition at a time when international cooperation should be at the core of our global society. We ask ourselves the questions in the newsrooms and in lecture theatres, whose death rate is lower, who can loosen lockdown restrictions first, who didn't have to go into lockdown in the first place, whose leader is shrouding themselves in glory and who's is, who is embarrassing themselves on the global stage. Now, and amid these crass comparisons, and by crass, I mean, I don't think it's healthy, excuse the pun, but I don't think it's healthy to be exalting numbers and, and, and death tolls at, at a time that of, of such political um, and, and health uh, crises across the globe. Uh, but along these comparisons, one line of thinking that has emerged most clearly, and that is simply the line, women leaders are more adept at managing COVID-19 than their male counterparts. Indeed, it's a claim that went and is continuing to go viral extremely, extremely quickly. Women leaders are being seen to and have shown the ability to be more likely to demonstrate a much more stronger, to use the word again, ability to lead, excel, um, and gain the confidence of their electorate within this current pandemic, as opposed to male leaders seen around the world. And at first, few seem to question whether this is true, because the stats, of course, and the facts and the statistics don't lie. There are plenty, plenty debated 
why it would be so. Was it because of the women themselves and their more female leadership style? Or was it a signal about the societies that elected them? Whatever the explanation, the belief in the phenomenon itself has gained attention. That is no doubt. Well, it certainly has gained my attention. <laughs> However, despite this rapid increase in attention, for the moment, I think it's important to note, we can arguably, we cannot draw comprehensive, conclusive or longitudinal conclusions. We need to be honest about this. But I will say for that for this moment in time, what we can say is that it's simple. There seems to be a pattern here. And now we just need to get the real longitudinal das data to back this up. But let's look at the pattern here, because this is where it's all going to begin and where the evidence and research will continue for years to come. So with this pattern, of course, how could we not begin by discussing and shining a spotlight on New Zealand's uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who arguably emerged as a champion of governance thanks to her decisive and early action, her straightforward messaging and her humane interaction with with and for the concerns of the citizens. And of course, this is not just Arden. Germany, led by Merkel, has far fewer deaths than that of Britain, France, Italy, or Spain. Finland, where the prime minister is, is only 34, and I do bring age in this because it's very um, distinct from what we're seeing from other nations. Um, and she is governed with a coalition of four female-led parties, they've had far fewer than 10% as many deaths as nearby Sweden. And the president of Taiwan has presided over one of the most successful efforts in the world at containing the virus, using testing, contract tracing, and isolation measures to control infections without, without a full national break, um, breakdown, excuse me, lockdown. So while musing on the relative efficiency of these leaders in the women leaders in the pandemic, a few shared traits are consistently pulled out. Is it thanks to their natural qualities of empathy, compassion, and humility that that are that they are excelling? Almost as though men are devoid of these qualities altogether? I do not think this is the case. However, this is something I wish to highlight now and, and the as I said, the, the talk is precise, but this needs highlighting, even in a short space of time. Chalking up the success of these women to tired feminine tropes, of course, glosses over an entire raft of national idiosyncrasies that have nothing to do with the character of these leaders. Population density, long held cultural mores, geographical location, historical pandemic preparedness, and the presence of even major international transport hubs are all critical for a start. This is not denying or taking away from the success of these leaders, but it is simply broadening the scope for how we view leadership in this context. And while it is true that Arden, for example, has distinguished herself with her response, New Zealand's debt rate stands at just 21 out of 1,000 and, and I do not like to use the word adjust. Ever, of course, every death is counts and is of of noteworthy. It is. It stands at twenty one out of one thousand four hundred ninety seven declared cases. But New Zealand is the one hundred sixty seventh least densely populated country in the world, and that has little to do with Arden, whether she is a compassionate or a cold leader, and whether she is loved or loaded has equally little bear, bearing on the crucial factor that New Zealand is either a, not a major transport hub, and that is the closest major landmass land to Australia. I could go on about that point and the notions of that, but it's very important to keep in mind the other important criteria um, surrounding these. And more critically, we should resist the powerful, and I think from my work on gender and diplomacy, I think we should resist the powerful inclination to ascribe the relative triumphs of women within this crisis to their personal traits relating to what we deem as feminine traits. And that is, of course, distinct from biological um, traits. If we are forced to accept that feminine qualities are the source of good government, government now, then it is hard to avoid the conclusion that the inverse might also be true. Compassion, empathy and humility 
might help out in a pandemic, I think might, might be an understatement, certainly more than help out in a pandemic. But then where does it leave women leaders in our own minds and as policymakers, say when we are engaging in a trade negotiation between the likes of Trump and Putin? What we are seeing among these female leaders, and I quote the Prime Minister of Iceland here when she states, quote, gender isn't necessarily important as long as the right decisions are made. Leaders who follow the advice of scientists and make transparent decisions about what measures they are taking and relaying it to the public is what makes and is making women leaders a success within this pandemic. And indeed, some deeper things are going on here. And I found this personally quite fascinating when I was researching this. So women, as we know, traditionally haven't been in these sources of high power. So we haven't really seen these circumstances or these studies and, and these conclusions being allowed to emerge for us to gain this insight really before. But because they haven't been traditionally in these sources of power, women have had to develop the skills. And as working as a diplomat before, I can attest to this, they've had to develop the skills to garner tremendous relationships skills because if you do not have institutional power, the best way to protect yourself is by knowing what is going on. And the best way to know what is going on is by having trusted relationships with people who can tell you and give you early warnings of crises, of policy making decisions and so on. So I think in a crisis, be it a pandemic or otherwise, what we are seeing is the ability to communicate efficiency with people, efficiency with people, develop relationships with people, connect with high levels of empathy. And that is what we're seeing with women leaders um, across nations. And one quote that has always stood out for me, and, and it's in the intro of one of my um, books on gender and diplomacy, Harold Nicholson, um, um, a prominent diplomatic scholar, he once wrote, and I quote from memory because it's always stuck in my mind, but he quote, he quoted, and this was not that long ago, quote, women are prone to the qualities of seal, sympathy and intuition, which unless kept under the firmest control can be dangerous qualities in international affairs, end quote. So I think Carol Nicholson might be being proven a little bit wrong in, in the circumstance. <laughs> so as I said, while it's difficult to develop robust conclusions due to the comparative nature of the crisis, what we can see at this time that when certain people are going around talking about a need for quote, strong leadership, which is code for what we know in diplomacy scholarship and politics as, as male leadership, um, is not what we need. What we need is empathy. Now this is not just related to females and, and, and women. These are traits. What we need is empathy, communication, and most importantly, most importantly, the ability to collaborate and communicate with others who may be better at the subject than you are. I know that might seem obvious, but we have seen even from the introduction today, the rightful um, you know, uh, anecdotes that we have seen leaders simply take on, male leaders take on tasks that they are not competent in. And that is, we do not, as, as prime ministers, or leaders, you do not have to be a scientist, but you need to have the ability and the humility to engage and collaborate with those who know better than you do. And also I think women are very strong and tremendous um, improvisers simply by their nature. And they're very good at change. And I come back here to the issue that I just mentioned. And that is because women historically have, be this in academia, be this in diplomacy, they've not truly been able to depend on institutional, institutional support. And it has, and it does undermine women in terms of opportunity. But the fact that we are so used to dealing with situations like this, not all women, not all men, but a lot of women who are so used to dealing with situations like this that we have not been able to anticipate, allows us the ability to react quickly and strongly and coherently. And this is a formidable life strength. And if you walk into a culture where everything is set up for you, and mostly that is of the white West, Western male in, in, in a diplomatic institution, you don't arguably have to develop those skills as everything is designed for you. And that's 
no fault of it, of the persons of the white Western male that who is engaging with this. It's simply how diplomacy was emerged, defined and continues to run. But if as a woman you walk into this culture that is not to des to designed to support you and does not necessarily believe in you, you have to develop greater skills, greater stratagems and a wider range of leadership skills to get ahead. So women leaders get ahead, and we're seeing this in, in, in the virus, not by following the exact rules per se, but by adapting quickly and designing and redesigning their own skills and strategy. And that is a tremendous leadership capability. And in fact, what we are realizing is that uh, the efficiency of the pandemic response has also much less to do with personal characteristics of the leaders in question and it ties back to an earlier point I was mentioning and far more to do with the type of countries they lead in the first place. We remember the obvious statement that each country's pandemic or experience of the pandemic is very different, an obvious statement. So let's broaden our perspective here for a moment. What if countries led by women are managing the pandemic more effectively not because they are women, but because the election of these women is a reflection of societies where there is a greater presence of women in positions of power in all sectors. Healthy societies are more likely to generate more female leaders and healthy societies are also surprisingly better equipped to, my, uh, to mitigate a pandemic. Greater involvement of women results in a broader perspective on the crisis and paves the way for the development of a richer and more complete solutions than if they had to be imagined by homogenous groups. Helen Lewis was right when she wrote in the Atlantic recently that strong female leadership, so strong female leaders and leadership in times of COVID-19 are not the cause of, but the symptom of good governance. And it should not only strike us as odd, but also pernicious that we are happy to resort to gender stereotypes to explain away differences in national outcomes under a pandemic. It's taken many, many years and it's gonna take many, many more with a lot of more progress to be made. We've made huge progress, but of course there's still more to make um, to shake off the presumption that women cannot be, leader, cannot be leaders thanks to womanly characteristics. And it's taken much time to rid ourselves of lazy assumptions that men cannot or perhaps should not share these qualities too. So one of the key points I, I, I really want to get across, and I hope I'm getting it across clearly, is that it is these characteristics and it's the society and the good governance and the healthy notions and political systems that have developed which have allowed these leaders to emerge. So yes, what we are seeing is women leaders successfully being and engaging in the crisis more successfully and, and doing a substantially better job than a number of male counterparts. But it is not simply because of gender, indeed that it's just one variable. So to conclude on this, I would say we should resist drawing conclusions about women leaders from a few exceptional individuals acting in exceptional circumstances. And that is not to dilute their work. And one point to note is that we have never seen so many female leaders in a crisis or being highlighted in the news in history. So we are beginning to see how they're acting and it's wonderful to see the job being done so well. But experts can say that women's success may still offer valuable lessons about what can help countries weather not just this crisis, but others in the future. And to draw on the work by a number of economists economists in the University of Liverpool, they stated, and this is how I will end, that their findings show that COVID-19 outcomes are systematically and significantly better in countries led by women. And to some extent, this may be explained by the proactive policy responses they adopted, even accounting for institutional contexts and other controls. Being female-led has provided countries with an advantage in current crises. Examining what is already known about the gender differences in behavior from a variety of disciplines gives us some insight in observed differential behavior of female and male ladies 
in tackling the current pandemic. So I know that was a lot to get through during during this time, and there was many sections of that of that um, talk that I could have um, expanded on for quite um, uh, a number a number of more more minutes. But as I said, it would be wrong of me as an academic and as a former diplomat, um, and simply just as someone as a researcher wishing to engage in the true facts to draw robust conclusions um, on what we have seen so far. But the facts remain clear, as I said, there is a pattern here. Women have excelled during these crises and they have excelled, they excelled from their empathy. They have excelled from collaboration with experts outside of the realm transparency with their population and then that gives them credibility with their populace which I think is very much lacking in a number of countries we've seen but that can be reflected in male leadership too so this is not um, a talk or a point to say women leaders are the only ones to rule during a crisis no there are a number of variables at play and this is where now our work comes in and hopefully we can begin to develop and really unpack this further for policy implications as we continue forward and see how we can, when we're opening back up all the countries, create a better system of governance for all. So I will end it there. Many thanks indeed, Jennifer. That was absolutely fantastic. Yet another woman who's excelling in terms of explaining, I think, a fascinating phenomenon which a few of us have come to notice, but haven't, I think, previously heard so uh, rigorously explained. And um, I'm glad to say that we've got about a quarter of an hour or so in which uh, Jennifer's very kindly agreed to take questions which have been coming in. You can still send them in. Please send them in through either the chat window on YouTube or hashtag Oxford at home. And I'm going to jump straight in here, actually, Jennifer, with a question from, uh, sent through Facebook from Diane. And this hat, well, this actually really picks up on exactly where you left off, the question about policy application. Because yes. Diane asks, you suggested that women learned the ability to collaborate, and the word learn there in quote marks, because of the historical position of women. So how is collaboration and reliance on others to be taught to those who are already used to power? In other words, how do you transfer the skills? Excellent question. And I wish I had the answer. <laughs> I wish I had the concise. I will. I will give my best attempt at answering the question. I think it is one of the most pinpointed questions that needs to be addressed today, because um, as the question, as Anne rightly noted, and as, as I said, it is because of women's traditional experiences, and these takes. This is generations. Sometimes, you know, career. It is, this, is, this is over a longitudinal career of having to collaborate and build relationships and, and trust. So uh, that does not help in the short term, of course. That's not going to work. We're not going to be like, we'll give you 50 years and then we'll see. So how can we do this in the short term? My, res my uh, immediate response would be here, but of course it would be something that I will continue to work on is, the hope that the demonstration that we have seen with the wonderful leadership of these of these female um, and there has been wonderful leadership also of male um, uh, leaders in, in the crisis as well and I wanted to note that but of course the topic is women during coronavirus um, I'm not discounting male leadership male leadership in the crisis but I'm I'm hoping that by the you know that phrase you can't be what you can't see. That also may apply here. So if male, if male leaders, male policymakers, female policymakers who have also done a not good of a not a, a good job in this as well, if people who have been reluctant to collaborate before, reluctant to engage, reluctant to build those relationships, but are seeing the success of doing this, are seeing the su success of these leaders reaching out to experts in, in the other field, they may be inspired to say, oh wait, this actually works. I'm gain and these leaders are gaining the confidence of their populace. They're, they're being transparent. 
and they are dealing with the pandemic in a very efficient and excellent way. So in the short term, I'm hoping simply symbolically that if we highlight this enough, they may we may be able to speed up that process. Um, yes. No, I mean, that's that, that's a fantastic piece of advice. And I just want to pick up on the back of that with a question of my own, if I may, yes, uh, Jennifer, as, as a, um, a, a specialist on Asia, because actually um, we've heard mentioned quite a lot, Tsai Ing-wen, leader of Taiwan, and there's another one of these, these leaders who's done yep. very well. But of course, all of the leaders we've been talking about so far are one other thing. They're all Democrats. And I found myself thinking, first of all, at Hong Kong, led by Carrie Lam, a uh, woman, uh, not democratically elected, of course, chosen by a committee appointed by, by Beijing. Mm -hmm. Now, Hong Kong has actually had a very good record on COVID-19. It's also recently introduced a pretty draconian new security law. Another example, Myanmar, which essentially is led in significant part by Aung San Suu Kyi, an Oxford graduate, as, as yeah. it happens. And most of the reports suggest that Myanmar actually has a pretty good record for a very poor state on COVID, but it's had it largely by arresting large numbers of people, including 15-year-old and 16-year-old children. So these are also examples of female leaders using yeah. non- or semi-democratic tactics as well. Where, if at all, do they fit into the model? So if, if I just can make sure I'm getting your, your, your question right, we're not, we're, we're bl not blending, but we're adding in the those other characteristics. Well, I think the question, the question, I guess, is, does it matter whether or not female leaders are also elected Democrats in this scenario? Or well, is there a way in which authoritarian leaders can have some sort of role in this model? About Well, I think, yeah, so I I don't want to be advocating for authoritarian regimes, I think, for obvious reasons. It's Friday afternoon, um, you might want to put yourself a little. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's go wild. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I shouldn't say that. But uh, we've seen, I think, regarding the authoritarian regimes and a number of factors that are put in place. Be, I think this is no, di the pandemic is no different for how they handle a number of other scenarios. Um, there's sort of the strategies that they are being, are, are being put in place um, in a number of these um, nations you've just mentioned have been put in place in a number of political crises that we've already seen. And so authoritarian regimes, they work right, like they work in this context because it's, it's done by done by force. Um, now it's good if there's a lack of deaths, of course, if that's the outcome in, in the case of a pandemic, um, but not good for a variety of, of course, a host a host of other reasons. Um, but you are, you know, that's a very good point to bring up the 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 nature of of the leader themselves, and actually someone that I didn't point out that I wish to point out. Um, was also the leader of um, um, the Caribbean states who was, uh, and she has done a, um, a phenomenal job as well. And very, very strict in her tone. If you watch the video, she just, just said, repeated five times, stay home, stay home, stay home, stay home, stay home. It's just, you know, very direct. But I think, Yes, success. You can you can add along with those characteristics that I've mentioned for from democratically elected leaders. Of course, you can add the success of these other ones, but those successes are come at the risk of you know we get into the debate then of at, at what cost do you? Um, yeah, no, ex ex excellent point. But, but no, but very good comparison to to make to to bring up. As, the, as, as I think the theory gets, yeah. gets wider. Yeah. But you mentioned you can't uh, do what you can't see. And I'm afraid some viewers can see a furry tail moving back and forth behind my back. That's actually our cat Maddie, who is blackmailing me by insisting that at four o'clock it's time for her to eat. So I'm going to try and ignore her for the next 10 minutes or so as we, we continue with, with questions. But excuse me if there is a, a feline presence. What kind of leaders they would be is, is not so uh, so clear to me. Well, Taiwan would like them to live the same. Well, there would there would be uh, no doubt part of uh, part of that too as well. Absolutely. Now, let me. Uh, there's plenty of questions coming in. So here's one from Arvind. Uh, it's come in on Facebook, and Arvind asks, "What would you say if someone says better pandemic management is actually the result of giving priority to healthcare? It's not a matter of which gender is leading the, the country. So could infrastructure rather than gender be a more important factor? Certainly, and and." Due to the time nature of 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 the talk, um, I 
I hope I got it across and if, and if I didn't, this is obviously a good time to reiterate that while we're seeing the beacons of light of, you know, women leaders and all the, and, and, you know, as someone who writes on it, of course I exalt them, but it is a, it's a system, as I said, of good governance in which health is a key role. So if you look at the healthcare structures in a lot of these systems, they enabled um, a much more efficient use also with contract tracing and just the, the health system itself and the ability for the, the communication and transparency between the health systems, national health systems and the government. So it's not just the leader making all the decisions, it is the entire country at play that allows the leader. I think it would be, I think it would be very um, untruthful to, uh, to use a diluted word to say that if even uh, Jacinda Arden, who's, you know, everyone's heralding her as one of the best leaders, that if she was in charge of another country who did not, who had all these other different challenges, I think we would see a very, very, very different outcome, even if every single thing about her stayed the same. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's great that you bring up Jacinda Ardern, the New Zealand Prime Minister there, uh, Jennifer, because actually it enables me to, I'm going to bring together a couple of questions on similar yeah, yeah. areas and, and then bring sort of two or three of them together to you to, to answer in a group, if, if I may. This one's from Ke Kimi, which is coming on YouTube, and uh, she actually says, I thought empathy was a key quality of Jacinda Ardern. One of her key mantras was be kind, which offered much more reassurance than stay alert. And, you know, wondering if you agree yeah. with that. And I wonder if Kimi actually is from New Zealand herself. But I want to link in also a question that's come in from uh, Dung on mm -hmm. Facebook. And that was, should we start teaching men in power to have the power of empathy similar to uh, to women? And, and, and a second one, a third one here, which is a bit more of a flyer, because I don't know the answer to this from your point of view. It's from Rachel, also in from Facebook. Jennifer, have you read Carl Stern's book, Flight from Woman? Is that something you're aware of? At all? No, OK, sorry, I Rachel. Probably, I probably should yeah say yes I have but I'm not going to lie no, no, I no, no. We, 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 we're, all, we're all about sticking to our expertise here right yeah, so I, we won't, won't, won't bring, bring that one yes, uh, but I, I, that, what, what's that, the name that, of the book because I will um, Flight from Woman by Carl Stern but um, linked linked to that, there's one. Um, yeah, I think actually this is a follow up from from Dung. In fact, on, on on Facebook, what's your opinion on leaders' political stance in shaping their response? If a female Donald Trump, Le Pen, were to grab power, would that country still deal with the virus badly? All of these, I think, come together. We've we've already addressed a little bit the question of whether or not you know men could be taught empathy or, or you know vice versa. As you pointed out, it doesn't yeah. just go one way. What I think I'd want to ask is, can you think of a sort of almost a worked example? I mean, is Jacinda Ardern, despite, you know, obviously there are other female leaders are available. Does yeah. she provide a good case study that people in maybe policy schools are going to be using for years and decades to come? Is the Jacinda Ardern case going yeah. to be the MPPs of the future are all yeah. places like the Povatnik School here in Oxford? Yeah, like her be kind, like she did... Um, I don't know if people watch you, her. She did her live streams on Instagram, you know, very like almost very FDR fireside chants um, type of, of, you know, scenario. And she always ended them with, you know, be kind, stay inside, you know, um, look out for each other. And so, yeah, empathy plays a key role. And as I said, I, I'm, I'm wary of, of saying that empathy is, of course she has empathy but i'm wary of saying it's just for women um you know um coming from ireland from my, myself i think ireland has done a remarkable job um in dealing with the 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 crisis uh it was our cabinet is primarily male um but i think they showed you know great empathy um this also relates to the health structure as well our our t shock our prime minister was a doctor medical doctor beforehand um so you know and and that relates to can we teach men empathy i don't personally i i i wouldn't even like to phrase it like that because i know so many men in my life who have so much empathy i was just talking about um, my wonderful um previous supervisor um, you know, uh, in Oxford. Um, I don't think men lack empathy. I don't think this is, you know, from my from my research and, and the works and the books and the, the neuroscience that I've got, I, I don't think there's as much difference as we see. I think it's the institution. So when I talk about with gender and diplomacy, I actually talk about the gender of diplomacy. So you can talk about the gender of leadership. 
which means it's actually it's it is about the entire system and the entire structure it's not it is how it's built so it is not taking the inclusion of men for granted or the exclusion of empathy in this case of men for granted but rather how normative ideas of man of of malehood and you know male characteristics have shaped diplomacy and leadership so i i i don't i think men uh, certainly don't need to, need to be taught em empathy. Um, I think I think they have it. Um, I, I think they just need to show it more and the system, I think, needs to allow them to show it more the system. And we all need to restructure the system where empathy is rewarded rather okay. than looked down. Well, I'm informed by uh, the controllers of the, of the session that um, there's a lot of cat chat going on and Mudkips on YouTube is asking, when is Maddie the cat getting a treat? Uh, she's asking the same question to me and the answer is very soon, very soon. Yeah. I think though, not before we have time for one last question. It's a sort of forward looking one, uh, I think. Yeah. It's from, uh, well, I'm going to slightly adapt it. She's a question from uh, Jeremy, what's coming on email, uh, in fact. Uh, cool. But uh, the question is, do you think this disparity between leaders' approaches will become clearer over time? And I think the way we could adapt that is the next phase after COVID itself is going to be the economic crisis and the reconstruction of many societies around the world. Do you think that your approach to looking at gendered response to crisis will be as valid for dealing with economic crisis as it has been on the question of pandemic crisis? This was something I was re reading on for the last few days, trying to look at the policy implications. Not to put down my own research on what I just said, no, I don't think what I've just said is going to be quite as valid because what I'm talking about right now is during a, a, a crisis where you need adapt, you know, uh, adaptability, you know, collaboration with others, but there's still so much we can learn, particularly the collaboration aspect that we talked about. What we can also learn is, as, and to tie back to the other key point, where and how did these leaders emerge? They emerged from healthy, good governance societies. They didn't emerge in a vacuum. And all of these, and, and transparency, something we are not seeing in, in so many other nations. And you know, the, uh, one of, on, the, on the bio of, of the introduction talk that, that I had given, you know, when, when President Trump visited the hospital, he said to, you know, professional medical doctors, I think I have a natural ability as a scientist. I should have been one. And okay, I know he's an outlier case, but it's still we could use that to say, you know, it's OK to know your limits. You know, you, you're, you do not need to know everything, but you, you need to know when to collaborate. So there's a lot of stuff regarding going forward collaborate like collaboration healthy governance uh policy structures um transparency which can all hopefully allow us some healthy recovery as we all try and muddle through this uh, very new terrain and hopefully new and never to be repeated terrain Jennifer, I feel the only limits that we're going to be limited by today are the limits of time. You have yep. given us a tremendous amount of that time and also your amazing expertise. I think that there's no question that any of the any one of the thousands of people who've been watching today across our various platforms will look at the whole pandemic crisis in a completely new way. And Jennifer's work is just one example of the amazing range of research and teaching and interaction with the public sphere that is going on here at Oxford, even during the current crisis and will continue to go on. So we're really glad that so many of you from around the world joined Jennifer, joined us today to take part in that. We want to thank you very, very much for that fantastic Thank you, and thank you very much for having me. And not ever, at all. Well, we're, we're not finished with the programme because this time next week, on the 17th of July, we'll be hearing about the Queen's Secrets. So we're definitely sticking with the question of powerful women. In this case, though, in 18th century France. And you can find out more details about that on the webpage uh, just under the video. Thank you to all of our audience for watching from around the world for this episode of Oxford at Home. Many thanks to the team behind the scenes there. Many thanks to Dr. Jennifer Cassidy and from Maddie the Cat, who is now desperate to get her supper. And from me, Rana Mitter, thanks very much for being part of Oxford at Home. Good afternoon. <laughs>